Hi everyone, this is Lahiri from ABC's Anesthesia, and today I'm going to go through bag mask ventilation technique and all the ways to optimize it, make sure you're doing a really good job, tips and tricks, and the overall approach and strategy. So let's get started. So it's really important that you only do these techniques if you're trained in performing these techniques. And again, this video will be a small part of the process of your learning on how to effectively bag mask ventilate. Now, the first disclaimer is that this is a really high-end technique. Even though bag mask ventilation seems non-invasive, just remember that most of the time you'll be doing this on patients who are hypoxemic and quite unwell. And that means that from the very start, it's so important that you need to call for help if this is something that you need help for. Now, as always, I really like to teach something in isolation. As you know from all my other videos, I try to make sure that everything has a structure and a framework so you know where it fits in the overall plan. So these resources are the Difficult Airway Society and also the Vortex Approach, and I'll put some links uh, to those resources in the story notes below. The aim of all of these techniques, whether it's LMA ventilation, intubation, or bag mask ventilation, is that you may have a patient who's not ventilating appropriately or not oxygenating. And so you need to create flow of air and oxygen through the mouth, down through the pharyngeal and oropharyngeal structures down into the trachea to raise the chest. So you're really trying to give positive pressure ventilation when a patient isn't able to do negative pressure ventilation on their own or effectively enough with their diaphragm. As you can see with bag mask ventilation, I've got this inflatable soft mask and that just gets placed onto the face. This mask has to create a good seal so that no air escapes. That way I can generate a positive pressure, which then forces air through the mouth around that corner and therefore you're kind of getting airflow through the oral axis, pharyngeal axis and tracheal axis, therefore inflating the lungs. And in this position, you can see that there's rise and fall of the chest. So now one of the important things is how do we get a good seal? Now each face mask is slightly different, but I want to give you the principles. Therefore, you'll know how to fit a mask no matter what style it is. The first thing you'll notice about this mask is that it's in kind of a triangle style structure. Just know that the pointy end goes on top of the bridge of the nose and the flatter part, the bottom of this triangle, goes just in the um, groove above the mental prominence. As you can see, there's a couple of valleys here. So the one is just the bridge of the nose and the other is this point over here. And that way you know that the mask fits. Now, if the mask was too large, you might see this hanging over the edge, therefore you get a leak there. If the mask is too small, you might find that it doesn't even cover the mouth properly. That way you know your vent you're not gonna be able to get a good seal, therefore you're not gonna be able to positive pressure ventilate. So your mask should fit at the bridge of the nose and through that groove there just above the mental prominence, just below the lip. That way you've got a good seal. Now, the next thing that you, we often learn when we're doing bag mask ventilation is the grip on the mask. You notice that we talk about a C and E grip. So when I'm demonstrating the C E grip, the C is this shape over here. And you'll notice that I put my thumb at the top near the bridge of the nose and then my pointer finger just there. That way that can you know, create a bit of pressure across the mask through the top and the bottom of the mask. Now my E grip, goes here. So I've got my little finger just at the angle of the jaw, and then I've got this uh, ring finger just along the side of the bone, and then finally the middle finger at the chin. One important thing to note is that these fingers aren't pushing into the soft tissue, they're really just around the bone. Now, once you've got this CE grip, one of the really important things to note is that really you want to try and lift the face towards the mask. So you're not pushing down because that obstructs all the structures. So you really want to see a lifting up of the face towards the mask rather than pushing the mask down. If you just look at that, lifting up opens up the airway and tries to align those three axes, whereas pushing down on the face really doesn't help. It makes the angle more acute. Therefore, mag mask ventilation will be a problem. So here we go. That's the CE grip. Sometimes your mask is just going to be a little bit different. You might have a mask which doesn't have this really nice soft inflatable plastic, or you may have a face shape that's a bit different. So often elderly faces have less structure to them. Someone who doesn't have dentures might have you know, the face falling away. In this case, you've got to do everything you can to make sure that this mask creates a seal. So that's where you'll see people adopting a different grip. For example, the most common thing is to do a two-handed grip. As you can see here, I've got this double CE grip. I've got a C shape here, a C shape here, E shape along the jawline there, and another E shape along the jawline, just mirroring the other side. Again, I'm lifting the face and I'm not pushing down. 
lifting the face opens the airway, pushing down obstructs the airway. Now, you might be wondering, how am I going to ventilate this patient? You get someone to help you out, and that way you can have someone else ventilating while you're doing this. So you won't have another hand to help you. So you'll need to get your assistant there to ventilate the bag while you're creating this really strong seal with the mask. Now, often I get asked this question, what happens if I've got really small hands or if I'm just not as strong with my hands and they're fatiguing? One of the really good things you can do is use your palms and then you've got all four fingers to lift up the jaw. And that way I've got all the strength of my intrinsic muscle of the hand, not just my fingers. So again, I'm lifting up and then I'm pushing down and that provides really good access to give a good jaw thrust as well as you know, using your, your whole palm pushing down as your fingers are lifting up. Now there's a few other things that can cause a problem with the seal. Generally this is elderly patients who have the face shape drooping away and that makes it difficult to make a seal but also patients uh, who have a beard, really hard to get a seal with that. If I really need someone to be optimized because they've got really bad other indicators of airway problems, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask them to shave their beard because it's a it's potentially a life and death thing. So in that circumstance where I've got a patient who's a difficult intubation and a difficult LMA and they're sick in another way, maybe they've got hemodynamic compromise or they're hypoxemic, I'm just going to ask them to shave their beard because I really want to make everything absolutely optimal. Now, when I'm teaching airway specialists like anesthetic registrars, I try to teach an overall approach with all of these different techniques, whether it's bag mask ventilation, LMA or intubation and ventilation. So first of all, most of the ways you can optimize these things are change the size and the type, as well as positioning and paralysis. When I think about that, every patient, when you're trying to ventilate them, the positioning is far better if there's a sniffing the morning air position. So you've got lower C-spine flexion and atlanta occipital extension. And that means that really I want the tragus of the ear to be lined up with the sternal angle. And I've got a video on optimal positioning of the patient as well on the channel. And like occipital extension, again, just helps to align the um, three axes, the oral axis, pharyngeal axis, and the tracheal axis. So that's positioning. But giving paralysis is a pretty risky thing to do. So only do so if you're comfortable with knowing the way of giving it and managing the potential risks of that. But overall, the ways I can optimize things in general are changing the size of something, changing the type of it, positioning, and paralysis. Now, the specifics with bag mask ventilation include maneuvers and adjuncts. Now, the three maneuvers that are commonly talked about are jaw thrust, chin lift, and head tilt. And again, all of these things are really trying to align those three axes to give you that context. Let's just go through the jaw thrust, because this is probably the most common technique I use, because often with the jaw thrust, I do get that head tilt as well. So a jaw thrust is getting your fingers behind the angle of the jaw. Now, it's a really good cheat here that the angle of the jaw is right near where the ear is. It's as far back as you can go along the jawline. When I'm at that point, I then lift up and you can see that the jaw is moving. That means the jaw is attached really to the tongue and now the soft tissues of the tongue and other structures are lifted off the oropharynx and that means that the passage of air can now flow more easily. Now this mannequin is quite hard to do jaw thrust but the most difficult patients will also feel difficult. So just know that sometimes you need your strongest fingers to do this. So I use my pointer finger and my middle finger and sometimes I put my you know, my palm on the cheeks and that allows me to get an even bigger jaw thrust. So especially in the most difficult patients, uh, this is pretty optimal. And just showing that again, I've got my two strongest fingers, my pointer and my middle finger at this very posterior angle of the jaw. There's a plateau there. I then lift up and you can see how much jaw thrust I can get. Now, just to give you a bit of context, so imagine I've got this here. That's, that's exactly where the tongue is. Um, but now you can see a cutaway to see exactly how air flows. Now, sometimes the tongue and soft tissues are so pronounced that they're blocking the airway. So there's no passage of air possible. If I do a jaw thrust, I'm simply lifting those features up and that allows a nice aperture and opening into the airway. It allows the flow of gas and flow of oxygen. Now the head tilt is again a really useful technique. I often use this when I'm inserting an LMA as well as during, lar during laryngoscopy. And what this does, it, it, it again tries to line up those three axes. So by tilting the atlanta occipital joint, I'm now opening up the airway or trying to align the oral axis with the pharyngeal and tracheal axis. So all I'm doing is moving the head like this. But also I open the mouth so I can guide a laryngoscope in and that makes that easier. And otherwise I can use my left hand to do a head tilt 
because I'm going to use a right-handed technique to put in the LMA, which again we'll show in another video. So again, often the head tilt creates a less of a sharp angle. I'm able to put the LMA in and that way it falls in easier. So final maneuver, the chin lift. And really this is putting your fingers just at the chin or the mental prominence and then lifting up. To me, it, it is like a combination where when I do a jaw thrust, I can often then hold the jaw thrust in place with a chin lift. So this is more active and then holding that chin there is much easier. So that was jaw thrust, head tilt and chin lift. Again, these are common maneuvers that are really, really useful. Um, and if you ever have a patient who's obstructed on the ward, a high BMI patient, maybe they've been a bit narcotized and they're snoring, you'll find that simply giving a jaw thrust or a head tilt will be a simple technique and a simple way of relieving that obstruction. So those are the maneuvers. The next phase is really trying to show you the adjuncts and how we use the adjuncts. So really there's just two adjuncts, um, which are simple, pretty simple to use. And these include the oropharyngeal airway, called the Goodell's airway and the nasopharyngeal airway. Now, the Goodell's, so they come in a range of sizes. Green is the smallest one for adults. Yellow is the middle size, and red is quite large. Now, the way you size it is quite straightforward. Now, I'm gonna give you an example here. The aim of the Goodell is to unobstruct the airway. Because you've got all these soft tissues that potentially cause obstruction, a Goodell sits just behind the tongue, just sitting above the epiglottis and showing an aperture into the trachea. I'm just gonna give you a side view of that. Now that you've seen the anatomy, the sizing of a Goodell makes a lot more sense. For example, if I'm trying to get it past the tongue so that this aperture sits just below the tongue and just above the larynx, really I want to size it from the top of the mouth, so the incisor, down to the angle of the jaw. And that way I'm going past the potential obstructions. This green one, which is too small, goes from the angle of the lip, but doesn't go as far as the angle of the jaw. So this wouldn't fit as well. The red one, however, does fit. Now the way this fits is, it's kind of an interesting insertion technique. What I do is I put it backwards, it's facing upwards when obviously it should be sitting down and that just allows me to get past the tongue in an efficient way. So I place it in and then I rotate as I go down. I'm just going to show that again from another angle. I open the mouth like this just briefly, I place the Goodell in, I rotate once, probably when the, the peak curvature is at the lip, I then curve it around and that point it's right behind the tongue in the correct position. At this point now, it's relieved any obstruction around the tongue, and I can use this mask on with a CE grip and ventilate the patient. Now, the final adjunct that I can potentially use is a nasopharyngeal airway. And just as the name suggests, it goes from a nasal angle down through the pharynx, and again, bypasses the tongue and other obstructive potential. Showing this on this anatomical structure here, so it will go from a higher angle, and again, it will bypass the tongue and, and any pharyngeal obstructions to try and provide a passage of air down into the trachea. Now, just from that, you can probably see logically how this is going to fit. So just like the Goodell, I'm going to size it from the nose, the opening of the nose, down towards the angle. So that's probably a little bit small. So what I want to do is get the right size there, and that's probably correct. Again, the nasal opening down to the angle of the jaw. Now, generally speaking, what I have to practically do, the nose has certain obstructions in itself. It's got turbinates and it's very prone to epistaxis and bleeding. So what I often do is I put a cofenyl cane spray, which is a vasoconstrictor, as well as local anesthetic. And that just means that it'll be tolerated if the patient is a bit more awake. So that means I do a couple of sprays of cofenyl cane in the nostril that, that I think I'm going to use. That's what I do before I insert this. There's a couple of things you really got to know. So because there is that risk of epistaxis and you're putting this in structures which are close to some apertures in the cranium, you really got to be careful in patients who are on anticoagulants. For someone who's on warfarin or, or rivaroxaban or any of the other antiplatelets as well, you want to be really careful and potentially not do a nasopharyngeal airway. Now again, a pretty decent contraindication is a patient who's had a trauma or a base of skull fracture, and that could be a real problem. If you place a nasopharyngeal airway through the nose, it could go through the base of skull into the brain. So again, any kind of trauma patient, um, anyone who's had surgery in that region as well, please avoid using this. So let's talk about the insertion. So the insertion is actually quite straightforward. Often, so again, I've lubricated and I've given some vasoconstrictor to the nose, and then I simply push it backwards. Just know that the aperture into the nose is straight back, and you don't have to go upwards. So it's really back posteriorly, and that's the way it should be inserted. Again, at this point, I could put my bag mask on if required and ventilate the patient as needed. 
Now, if the patient is semi-conscious and just obstructed, you don't really need to put the bag mask on. This patient, you will have unobstructed the airway. You might provide a jaw thrust, get the right position, which is like a semi-recumbent 30 degree position, and the patient will hopefully be ventilating fine while you ask for assistance and help. So why don't we go through the whole scenario of a patient who's potentially obtunded, and I'm trying to maximize everything. So just remember, I'm thinking about my overall strategy. I'm getting assistance. I'm thinking of positioning. So I'll get a pillow, raise them to the perfect position where I've got the mastoid aligned with the sternal angle. If I'm able to, I might consider paralysis at some point during this thing. So I've got assistance, positioning, paralysis. Patient needs some kind of ventilation, let's say. So I think of having the mask sized correctly and then creating good seal. I might use maneuvers such as a jaw thrust and chin lift to start ventilating the patient. If these maneuvers aren't working, I might need to consider adjuncts. So I'll size the right Goodell, insert that Goodell, and then ensure that I've got everything at my disposal. Say my seal isn't good, I'll get two hands on and get someone else to ventilate for me. So as you can see in a few seconds, I've thought about the overall context of the patient. I've enhanced the position, I've optimized the position. I've considered paralysis if I'm able to. I've got a good seal with two hands, jaw thrust, chin lift, and I've got a Goodell in and potentially thinking about a nasopharyngeal airway. Thanks everyone for watching. We've gone through bag mask ventilation um, in the context of airway management and shown you all the ways of optimizing bag mask ventilation and a few traps and tips and tricks to optimize it. So we've gone through bag mask ventilation itself, the anatomy, how to size a mask and the seal. We've gone through different maneuvers, jaw thrust, chin lift and head tilt. We looked at some adjuncts as well, which is the Cadell's airway or oropharyngeal airway and the nasopharyngeal airway. So we've gone through all that and then put it together in a context and how to continually assess for the patient's oxygenation and ventilation. So I hope this was useful for you. Um, share with anyone who might be interested and thanks for watching. See you next time.